I'm not like all the other hotels. I'm more what you might call boutique. Seeking a traveler with a romantic heart, must love leather lounge chairs, and a library brimming with poets from around the globe. Download the hotels app to find your perfect somewhere. This episode is brought to you by Audible.com. So after I finish telling you all the books I think you should listen to, please go to audiblepodcast.com forward slash WWII for your free audiobook download. They have tens of thousands of books, fiction, nonfiction, old radio programs, things like the old Sherlock Holmes mystery series. I love those. So again, if there's something you want, go out there and get it for free. But here's some of my recommendations. Uh, some of the books I'm listening to now, and here's a lot of them, so be prepared to hit stop, rewind, play. Um, one of the ones I'm listening to is Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin. Now, every, And this is by Timothy Snyder. Everybody knows about the um, roughly 6 million Jews that the Nazis killed. But in between uh, Hitler and Stalin, both of them basically tearing Poland apart because they had similar agendas. Roughly 13 million people were killed. So this, um, so Mr. Snyder goes into all the detail, the systematic um, way that they went about this. So it's a very gruesome book, don't get me wrong, but it was very um, enlightening. And it opened my eyes about what was going on in that area. Uh, and unfortunately, they were one of the first to be taken over. So it's it's a very good book, but it is very intense. But I think you'll learn a lot and you'll like it a lot. Another one that I'm listening to is Death Ride, Hitler versus Stalin, The Eastern Front, 1941 to 1945 by John Moser. Now, this is a good book. It talks about the battle between these two countries, but he kind of takes a different spin. His his idea is that the war was basically Hitler's to lose, and that he was doing everything he needed to, but that the Allies, the Americans and the British, um, what they were doing in North Africa and Italy actually saved Stalin, because everybody thinks about, a lot of people think about World War II as basically Germany versus um, the Soviet Union. Yes and no. But this takes something that we all find interesting and gives it a different spin, which I kind of like, because it kind of loosens you up your thinking and you can look at the war from a fresh pers- fresh perspective. Another one that I'm listening to is Armor and Blood, The Battle of Kursk, The Turning Point of World War II by Dennis Showalter. Now what I like about this is this is, you know, the largest tank battle in the history of the world. It's basically the two armies coming at each other. You've got 3 million men, 8,000 tanks slamming into each other, you know, roughly 400 miles south of Moscow, and pretty much whoever wins this is going to win the war. It's the linchpin, and he he's used a lot of records now that the Soviet Union has opened up, and I really think you'll like this one a lot. Um if you've ever listened to any of the Jeff Sharma books, those books are amazing. They're well-written, but the reader takes it to a whole nother level. He can do all the accents. He can do the voices. I enjoyed every single one of those, and I listened to them, I think, twice. Um, if you're into Roman history, the Masters of Rome series by Colleen McCullough, you will absolutely love those books. The readers are amazing, and you really get a, a really good um, detail about the different families in Rome that, that ruled the Republic and then the Empire. And um, depending on your age, if you've ever heard of James Clavell, but Audible has all his books and they are really amazing. They're unabridged. The reader does a great job and it is just one uh, exciting story after the other and it will make your commute disappear, I promise you. Another one I recently started is the Pax Britannica series by Jan Morris. Okay, well, that's enough for me. Those are just some of the books I'm listening to now. There is a long list of those on my website, worldwar2podcast.net. So please, when you get a chance, check out audiblepodcast.com forward slash WWII. Find something you like. Use one of my recommendations, but you will not be sorry. I've been very happy with Audible ever since I found it years ago. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 97, Back in the Saddle, Again. After Churchill's meeting with Prime Minister Asquith on May 22, 1915, which confirmed his ouster from the Admiralty, but also let him know that there was no place for him in the new national government, the 40-year-old felt like his life was over. Quote, I'm finished. I'm done, unquote. And with this feeling, his black dog, his depression, that he simply did not have time for since the war started, ambled up to him, 
sat on his lap, and made itself at home. Never had he been so low, especially after being so high. What with helping direct the war, and believing the Dardanelles plan would break the senseless, unproductive slaughter in France. Winston, the man, the person, who had fought all his life, against his father's hatred, against his mother's self-interest, against his teacher's agenda, against his superior's stubbornness, against the conservatives who ruined his father's career, against the time of his assumed early demise, and recently against the powerful Germans and the lucky Turks, now had no cause to throw himself at. His world now held no enemy that he could plan against or vanquish with his willpower, experience, and leadership. He was a warrior without a sword, a king without an army, a man without a purpose. For Winston was a warrior first and foremost, in some ways being born in the wrong century. But like every real warrior, he had adopted and adapted himself to the times. Still, his scabbard, at the moment, was empty. Quote, like a sea beast fished up from the depths, or a diver too suddenly hoisted, my veins threatened to burst from the fall and pressure. At a moment when every fiber of my being was inflamed to action, I was forced to remain a spectator of the tragedy, placed cruelly in the front seat. Unquote. Clementine wrote of this moment, quote, The Dardanelles haunted him for the rest of his life. He always believed in it. I thought he would die of grief. Unquote. Still, Churchill had a job given to him by Asquith and on the War Council, now called the Dardanelles Committee. But the post was the lowest one possible, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. But the newspapers mirrored Winston's thoughts when taunting him, quote, Where is Lancaster, and what is a duchy? Unquote. And though his salary was cut from £4,500 to £2,000 a year, life, just like debt, goes on. So, packing up, the Churchills left the Admiralty House and soon were ensconced in his brother's South Kensington House at 41 Cromwell Road. But to add insult to injury, as if seeing exactly how much salt could be rubbed into Winston's wounds, not only did the new Admiralty decide to end his tank research and production, but the army decided to immediately use what few tanks had made it through the process. So Winston, being Winston, rushed to Asquith's office, just like recent times past. But he did not demand anything. He begged that the tanks not be used until either enough had been finished to make it worthwhile, or perhaps detailed plans could be thought through to take advantage of the confusion they would cause the enemy. But neither came to pass. On September 15, 1915, the small number of tanks crawled over the land near the Somme. As expected, the Germans did not know what to make of this. But, as the British had not planned out a follow-up infantry incursion, it all came to nothing. Churchill later wrote, quote, My poor land battleships have been led off prematurely and on a petty scale. In that idea resided one real victory. If possible, Winston's depression worsened, and though he put forward his best face, the looks he received of pity or vengeance were too much. Churchill took his family and his brother Jack's children to a house in Surrey on the weekends. Still, this did nothing for the man who avoided guests and locals alike. He tried to take up golf again, but again found it to be similar to, quote, chasing a quinine pill around a cow pasture, unquote. But on one weekend in particular, his sister-in-law, called Guni, spied Winston, spying on her, as she painted in her garden, as was her wont. She could tell he was interested, and recommended he give it a try. As he walked over to her, he thought, could the muse of painting have something for me? This he doubted. That muse was all about charity and chivalry and that had nothing to do with him. Still, he would give it a go. The morose husband told Clementine of his thoughts, and she, desperate to bring him out of his despair, dashed off to a local shop and got him everything he needed. But I'll let Winston tell you himself. Quote, 
The next step was to begin, but what a step to take. The palette gleamed with beads of color. Fair and white rose the canvas. The empty brush hung poised, heavy, with a destiny, irresolute in the air. My hand seemed arrested by a silent veto. But after all, the sky on this occasion was an unquestionable blue, and a pale blue at that. There could be no doubt that blue paint mixed with white should be put on top of the canvas. One does not really need to have an artist's training to see that. It was a starting point, open to all. So, very gingerly, I mixed a little blue paint on the palette with a very small brush, and then, with an infinite precaution, made a mark about as big as a pea upon the fronted snow white shield. Unquote. Just then, a neighbor pulled up in her car, Hazel Lavery, who just happened to be invited over by Clementine. She also just happened to be a painter. Lavery strode up to Winston and confronted him. Quote, what are you hesitating about? Let me have a brush. No, the big one. Unquote. This was handed to her, and without hesitating, she sank it into the blue and white paint and then smeared it all over the top of the canvas. Later, Winston wrote that before she charged onto the scene, he had been cowering. But now, it seemed, the canvas was the one shivering. The spell was broken. Eddie Marsh, who was there to witness this, later wrote that painting seemed to be a, quote, distraction and a sedative that brought a measure of ease to his frustrated spirit, unquote. And Winston would go on to become a bold painter, of course. The canvas would do or be anything he desired. Here, he was the master. And that's how he liked it. And now that Winston was beginning to relax, he rediscovered his children. Sarah was still very young, but Diana was now six, and Randolph now four. He would play gorilla with them, which consisted of him hiding in the bushes, making gorilla-like sounds, and then chasing the children as they screamed with delight. And for the next six months, Winston would know a civilian's life. Meanwhile, Churchill's ex-First Lord, Fisher, had come full circle, again. He pushed through the council the sending of five more divisions to General Hamilton in Gallipoli. But instead of opening up new fronts and overwhelming the Turks, Hamilton simply fed them in behind those who had recently lost their lives. And by doing this, violated an old maxim of the military. Never reinforce failure. Hamilton's now 120,000 men would achieve nothing. But somehow, the general's failure was again placed at Winston's doorstep. As in, it was his idea, and a bad one, so the failure and shame should be his too. Then, Bulgaria entered the war on Germany's side, which to Winston caused new possible avenues of how to break the stalemate, to flash across his mind. But no one with authority listened to him. They no longer even trusted him. As Gallipoli now mirrored France and all its wasteful horror, on October 16th, General Hamilton was relieved of duty. His replacement, General Sir Charles Monroe, was told one of his first duties was to ascertain whether it was prudent to keep the campaign in the East going. But as Monroe, who had just come from fighting in France, was a confirmed Westerner, his conclusion, when he got down to writing it on paper, would spell the end of Gallipoli. Of Monroe, Winston later wrote, quote, He came, he saw, he capitulated. Unquote. But the dark times were just getting started for Winston. On November 6th, the Dardanelles Committee, now renamed the War Cabinet, confirmed one more major change. Winston was out, just like the Cabinet. So, Churchill submitted his resignation on November the 11th, and the Prime Minister made it official the next day. For weeks, Winston, who knew this was coming, had been asking Asquith for a field command, but Kitchener was hesitant as he did not want to, quote, offend the army, unquote. As Churchill was leaving office, and had held some position or another for the last ten years, custom dictated that he be allowed to address the House of Commons. And with his speech, he was not mean nor vindictive, but only thought of what was best for Britain, and that was to win the war. Quote, 
You may condemn the men who try to force the Dardanelles, but your children will keep their condemnation for those who did not rally to their aid. Undertake no operation in the West, which is more costly to us in life than to the enemy. In the East, take Constantinople. Take it by ships if you can. Take it by soldiers if you must. Take it by whichever plan, military or naval, commends itself to your military experts. But take it. Take it soon. Take it while time remains. Unquote. Winston in civilian clothes was no easier to ignore than the Winston at the Admiralty. Something had to be done with him. But again and again, Asquith and K of K declined his requests for a command. In the end, Winston relied on his commission in the Queen's own Oxfordshire Hussars for a place in the war. So, on November 16th, Churchill lorded over a farewell meal for himself. But violent Asquith still very much in love with him, thought of it as a wake. The next day, Wednesday, November 17th, Winston oversaw the packing of what he would need in France. Cigars, port, whiskey, vermouth, camping equipment, and other things that would make war pleasant. And the following day, Thursday, November 18th, Major Churchill crossed over into France. But waiting for him on land was a car, sent by Sir John French. Obviously, Winston was not an ordinary officer. But more than that, French's position with London, like Winston's before his end, was dicey at best. French set Winston up properly with champagne and a fine meal, and then put several options before the fallen First Lord. Winston straightaway wanted to command a brigade. But, as it had been at least fifteen years since Winston had been in combat, and war had changed tremendously. It was decided to place him with the Grenadier Guards for a time, to train. Fair enough, Winston agreed. Churchill approached the front, but on the way, stopped a few times, and was offered, one after another, several fine lunches with British and French officers who wanted to meet him. During one of these stops, Winston found out that he had been placed with the Grenadiers' 2nd Battalion, led by Lieutenant Colonel George Ma Jeffries. His attitude towards the newest addition was frigid at best. Perhaps a part of that was that Jeffries was the lone surviving officer first attached to the battalion in 1914. The rest were dead, and again Winston was being blamed for all those men who had been sent to Gallipoli. Of course, Winston knew they would have not made a difference there anyway, but there's no telling someone who feels they and theirs have been wronged. So, he didn't bother trying. Once up at the front, Winston was shocked. The conditions the men lived in were indescribable, but still, he was determined not to show his astonishment and make the best of it. His first night was spent in, quote, a sort of pit four feet deep, containing about one foot of water. Unquote. And it would be here, in Flanders, in this hellhole, that Winston would learn from his wife that the campaign in the East was over. The men were being pulled out after 213,980 British casualties and no ground gained. What's more, there were, ironically, no deaths to add to this number as the British withdrew, normally a good time to hit an enemy but the Turks were happy to see them go. General Hamilton and then General Monroe had muffed it. The embarkation would last through January of 1916. The lieutenant colonel was still cold to Winston, but the men under Jeffries learned to more than accept him, as he was very likable. Having received comfort items from home, Winston shared them with the men. Soon his supplies of cigars brandy, and food were running low, and his tin bathtub, gotten from Lord knows where, was in constant use. But they did the trick. The men came round. As for Jeffries, when Winston not only volunteered to be by his side during his daily and nightly walk around the trenches, but then requested to live, not at battalion headquarters, but on the edge of no man's land, the lieutenant colonel forgot all about hating the politician. I love that sound. The sound of another sale on Shopify. 
the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big businesses, so upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. Scaling your business is a journey of endless possibility. I love how Shopify has the tools and resources to make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale. With Shopify, you can reach customers online and across the social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. And you can synchronize your online and in-person sales. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash World War II, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash World War II right now. Shopify.com slash World War II. During one of Winston's celebrity lunches, where officers of superior rank showed up to meet the man, a French general gave Winston a Palouse steel helmet, and Churchill, a lover of uniforms, decided to wear it from now on, quote, as it looks so nice and will perhaps protect my valuable cranium, unquote. And during his time there, Winston genuinely enjoyed himself. How? Because it was in his nature to pit himself, not only against an enemy, but also the harsh conditions that are during war. He told the men around him that, unlike politics, here he felt free. He would fight and charge ahead if ordered. Fortunately for history, no major British offensive was executed during his time there. And die if it was to be. But here it was easier to see who was his enemy and who was his comrade. Concerning the Dardanelles, Winston called himself the escaped scapegoat. On November 30th, 1915, Winston's 41st birthday, the Germans bombarded his part of the line for three hours. And of course, that's how we saw it in those terms. The biggest, loudest birthday gift ever. The men sang songs and the guns offered up their gruesome music. But there were moments in between the guns and the mud that Winston and Clementine thought about his future long term. For now, as he said to her in a letter, he needed to make the best of this and get through. She mirrored his feeling and hope with, quote, Darling, I feel such absolute confidence in your future. It is your present which causes me agony, unquote. And as Churchill made the most of his present and was eager for his future, Sir John French obsessed about his past, or rather, his immediate past. That's because events, and quite frankly, Sir Douglas Haig, his subordinate, had conspired against him. Sir John was removed as the leader of the BEF on December 18, 1915. But a few weeks before his removal, French had all but promised, after checking with Asquith, to give Winston an appointment as Brigadier General, commanding the 56th Brigade of the 19th Division. But, as word got out about the upcoming promotion, certain Tory members of the House told Asquith they would not stand for this. After all, what experience did the former First Lord have? Well, quite a lot, actually. Certainly more than any of them. But Asquith, not wanting to rock the boat, had the elevation put aside. In the saddle now was Sir Douglas Haig, who had his good points. He was beyond cool under pressure able to hold vast amounts of detail in his head, and was absolutely confident in himself. But that last part turned out to be a flaw, a major flaw, because Sir Douglas Haig believed implicitly in the horse. Quote, the role of the cavalry on the battlefield will always go on increasing, unquote. To his mind, what was needed to break through was a mass of horse, as again, to his thinking, bullets had, quote, little stopping power, unquote, on them. Of course, this kind of thinking had been given up 
during the first days of the war. The bullets and guns projecting them were much larger and more powerful than Sir Douglas remembered. Oh, he did have one more asset to call upon. He had impeccable social connections, and his wife was a member of the royal family, which allowed Sir Douglas to write to the king and complain about Sir John French that he was not the man Britain needed at this time in their history. Soon after taking up his new position, Haig sent for Churchill. The destined field marshal was kind and understanding, and all but promised Winston a brigade. This was one of Haig's faces. The other one was consumed with, How can this person help me? And because Winston was someone, though currently in disgrace, but who was to say it would always be that way, on January 1st, 1916, Sir Douglas made Churchill a lieutenant colonel of the 6th Royal Scott Fusiliers, his own infantry battalion. But again, Winston was not wanted, but not because of who he was. The 6th Royal Scots, mostly miners from the Ayrshire coalfields, liked their current commanding officer very much, but he had been moved on, and Winston was stepping into his place. The mood upon his arrival was mutinous, to say the least. Churchill did not help himself, being a cavalryman, by giving commands infantrymen did not understand. But after his initial slip, Winston worked hard, as always, to learn the way of things. The men might not have liked Winston, but that was okay. He liked himself enough for everyone. And because he was not intimidated, he saw that their morale was low, and it wasn't just because they lost their leader. So Winston arranged concerts and games. At first, the men did not know what to make of this, but eventually, they loosened up. Winston also didn't see why the men's downtime could not be used to improve their education, at least in terms of their present situation. So one day, Winston, standing jauntily before them, with his adjutant Gibbs behind him, yelled out, quote, War is declared, gentlemen, on lice, unquote. According to Gibbs, Churchill put forth a detailed lecture on Pulix Europeua, its origin, habitants, and its importance in past wars. But all this was done with such force that when Winston was finished, the men went about delousing themselves with a passion, perhaps an earlier version of the scared straight policy. The 30 officers and 700 men came round to Winston's view of life and war. His personality would not tolerate anything else. Quote, laugh a little and teach your men to laugh. Get good humor under fire. War is a game that is played with a smile. If you can't smile, grin. If you can't grin, keep out of the way till you can. Unquote. On January 24th, 1916, Winston led his men to the Belgian village of Plogsteert, or Plug Street, as the Tommies called it. It was the 21st anniversary of his father's death. Winston took the occasion to write to his mother, Jenny. For the last few years, the vast majority of his letters went to Clementine, his mother relegated to the rear. That night, the men moved forward again, Churchill placing them along a section of the trench a thousand yards long, while he sat up behind them. Winston was now about 500 yards away from no man's land. And, like Caesar, Winston kept himself busy, with completing various reports, other paperwork, checking on his men, and walking his section of the line three times a day. On February 3rd, while having lunch at his headquarters, a simple house called Lawrence Farm, a shell hit the roof on the other side of the house. And because of where it hit, that side of the house was destroyed. Their side was protected, barely, by the separating wall. Still, everything was knocked from its place, including the men, who were now covered with dust and debris. Winston wrote to Clementine that night, telling her everything that happened. Some would think that, as he was unharmed, he may have left this little incident from his wife, but he told her all, expecting her to take it. He didn't think much of it, so why should anyone else? In that same letter, he told her that he had slept very well that night and requested she send him supplies so he could paint. By now, his men had fully come round to him. It didn't hurt that he actually moved his headquarters 100 yards closer to them. 
And though war is all hell, Winston still couldn't help but see that Haig wasn't running the show any more effectively than French had. As much as he enjoyed his time in the trenches, and he did, he wanted to be where he could influence things on a larger scale. Haig might not have ever visited a trench, but now that Winston had, changes, hell, improvements needed to be made. Now. Clementine, back on Cromwell Road, did what she could for her husband. She met with politicians and other influential men to put her husband's case before them. During one lunch, Lord Curzon came by and passed on the gossip that Winston was to be made a brigadier general any day now. Alas, it turned out not to be so. Lloyd George also stopped by. He said all the right things and expressed his sympathies and promises of friendship. But for Clementine, those days were over. Never again would she trust him. If only she knew how right she was. During this time, Lloyd George was doing all he could to undermine Asquith, hoping to replace him. But then, as much as the husband and wife wrote to each other and spoke on the phone, this only because of Winston's position, the two started viewing his political situation differently. In other words, Clementine, because she had her ear to the ground, knew that Winston's negatives were still high. However, Churchill, having been removed from the fuss and criticisms, was beginning to believe his popularity was once again on the rise. But then, Churchill destroyed any goodwill his absence had gained him on March 7, 1916. He had been allowed to come home for a visit and chose to give a speech from the opposition bench. He had decided now was the time for his right honorable colleagues to hear the truth about the current government's prosecution of the war. The Admiralty under Balfour had become lax and suffered from a, quote, want of push and drive, unquote. The U-boat threat was not being sufficiently deflected. German shipyards were outproducing British ones. The Zeppelins were allowed over British territory and wreaking havoc. The Navy, Britain's shield, was being mismanaged. Near the end, Winston had everyone paying attention. More's the pity for him. Most were impressed and glad that someone had finally said what many were thinking. But then, Winston ruined his speech and his immediate future by finishing with this sentence. Quote, I urge the First Lord of the Admiralty, without delay, to fortify himself, to vitalize and animate his Board of Admiralty, by recalling Lord Fisher to his post as First Sea Lord. Unquote. Everyone who had sat listening to his speech was stunned. What? Fisher? Bring back the man that had ruined Winston? And what most didn't know, help ruin the Dardanelles campaign? Clearly Winston had gone the way of his father. He had become soft in the head. Perhaps it was the effects of being so close to the shelling. Winston left the house without realizing the storm that was about to swirl around his speech and his name. Before anyone could get to him, Violet Asquith, who still loved him, got in first. She started off with, why did he do it? And then, what was he thinking? His reply was that, first, he wanted to appear magnanimous towards the man who ruined him. And secondly, as he only cared about a strong navy, Fisher still had, when he could be controlled, something to offer. But Violet set him straight on both scores. Still, Churchill decided against heading back to Flanders, but instead would go back to the house to explain himself. But he never got the chance. Balfour, perhaps not a great leader of the Admiralty, but a superb politician, tore into Winston and his comments. Churchill tried to fight back, but was knocked off his game and ended in an even weaker position. But so too was Asquith. That was the other result of this latest escapade. That's because before Winston shot himself in the foot, the points he was making about the war were true. And all that had to be laid at the doorstep of the Prime Minister. Which probably explains why, when Winston went to see the Prime Minister, Asquith promised that if he, Churchill, decided to re-enter politics, Asquith would not interfere. It may have even been guilt over letting Winston take all the blame for the Dardanelles, when in truth the Prime Minister, any Prime Minister at the time, had a fair share of it.
So, before heading to Dover to cross the channel, Winston wrote up his resignation and his intention to return to politics and gave the paper to his wife. On his way back to Flanders, Winston's blood was rising, his anger getting the better of him. But not at the Germans, no, at his former house colleagues. They had taunted him and enjoyed his being ripped to shreds by Balfour, and Winston wanted some payback. And, with his feelings leading the way, his brain played catch-up by creating reasons why it would be a good idea to return. He could grab the headlines with his re-entry and hold them with his charisma. He wrote to Clem, quote, Do not, my darling one, underrate the contribution I have made to the public cause or the solidarity of a political position acquired by so many years of work and power, unquote. All true enough, but Clementine parried with, quote, The present government may not be strong enough to beat the Germans, but I think they are powerful enough to do you in, and I pray to God you do not give the heartless brutes the chance, unquote. But immediately, the question was decided for him. Upon his return, Haig recommended to Winston that he re-enter politics and help pass a conscription bill through the House. That was the only thing that was going to win this war. That was the carrot. The stick was that his battalion was being merged with another, and as that commander had seniority over Winston. Winston wrote to Clementine the seemingly good news that, quote, I am not leaving my battalion. My battalion is leaving me, unquote. So off went his resignation letter directly to Kitchener, who replied that it was accepted but with the proviso that Winston never again reapply for active service. His last letter to his wife was sent out on May 2nd, 1960, days before he left the front line. On his last night there, the Germans fired 30 shells at his headquarters, hitting the house four times. Winston wrote, quote, This is, I trust, a parting salute, unquote. Only Winston would see it like that. In his last letter to his wife from the front, he also wrote the sentence, quote, The government is moribund. I only trust they will not die too soon, unquote. Now back at Cromwell Road, Winston found three MPs who wanted to join him in a cause of patriotic opposition. Such words are used during a time of war. And Winston was to find out the good and the bad of not being a forgotten man. Some cheered him, but some MPs, now that he was out of uniform, gave vent to their hatred of him. Some said that his quitting the army was proof that he was nothing more than an opportunist. Others said he was no better than his father and should not have even thought of coming back. But the worst blows came from some of the members of the small patriotic opposition party, supposedly his own allies. Some of them wanted nothing to do with him. But then Asquith took away their strongest part of the agenda by allowing the passage of a conscription bill. This began on May 25, 1916, but it must be said that before this date, some two and a half million Britons had volunteered for the colors. Now back in the House, Winston focused on his only subject, a better persecution of the war. The U-boat threat had to be met by convoys. Better equipment for the men in the trenches was needed. Medals were going to the men way behind the lines. There was a helmet shortage going on that had to be solved now. But all his ideas were met with silence. It wasn't the message, all these ideas were good. The convoy, when it was introduced, saved lives, ships, and supplies. It was the messenger. And Winston went on being right and ignored. The Battle of the Somme started on July 1st, 1916, and by that night, some 80,000 British troops had become casualties, 20,000 of them dead. Yet Haig did not alter his plans. Winston wrote, hoping to give the field marshal cover for pulling back, quote, So long as an army possesses a strong offensive power, it rivets its adversary's attention. But when the kick is out of it, when the long, saved-up effort has been expended, the enemy's anxiety is relieved, and he recovers his freedom of movement. This is the danger into which we are now drifting, unquote. 
But this helpful attempt was seen by many as an attack on Hague, which was an attack on Britain. Churchill was labeled the ringleader of a group determined to bring down the government. Then in stepped Clementine, who educated her husband on a fact that he had never bothered to learn. It is not enough to be right. You have to be right and inspire men to follow you. And not just any men, but the ones that matter. Leave enough room for them to shine alongside you. Then you will have a truly effective entourage, even if they don't know they are nothing more than an entourage. Sometimes Winston remembered this. Sometimes he did not. And though he was back, this was Winston's low point. He rarely spoke in the House, and when he did, few MPs bothered to enter and sit down and listen. Instead, he put forward his views by writing them up and having them published in the Sunday Victorial. Besides, he was getting paid £250 apiece for each article. After all, there was himself, his wife, three children, and his mother, Jenny. She had let her place to bring funds in, and so was staying with the family. And as much as Winston had been through since leaving the cabinet, he was about to receive a severe blow to his cause, namely the resurrection of his career. Back on January 11th of that year, 1916, Clementine, being confident that the only way to free her husband from the deadly weight of the Dardanelles was to ask Asquith to publish all papers, memos, etc. from the discussions and votes that brought it about. And this time, the man wisely listened to his wife. Asquith said he would think about it. And without Winston needing to do anything further, there followed months of chants of, quote, what about the Dardanelles, unquote, which could be heard throughout the country. In truth, this was no more than the latest way to vent at the bloody stalemate of the war. What if the war in the East had played out differently? Perhaps this could all be over. What happened out there anyway? Who's responsible? The people wanted answers. And, proving perhaps that he should have never been Prime Minister in the first place, that Venetia was right to leave him for another, Asquith agreed, on June 1st, to put the information about the Eastern Campaign before the people. Politics may indeed make for strange bedfellows, but so too does desperation. Winston immediately offered to help the government make sense of the expected volumes of paper dealing with the decisions leading up to the Dardanelles. But then came another voice offering its services. That voice, sounding lamely hopeful, came from General Ian Hamilton. He too hoped to clear his name with this investigation. And though his chances were far weaker than Winston's, Churchill agreed to meet with him. But Hamilton brought political dynamite to the table. Before him were some twenty telegrams he had sent to Kitchener that, for some inexplicable reason, were never seen by the cabinet. At face value, the implications were that Kitchener was either a saboteur for the Germans, which of course he wasn't, or he was guilty of negligence on a scale so grand neither man could or would predict what would be the outcome. Winston and Hamilton sat there in stunned silence, hefting the papers. Then, through the haze of their shock, they heard Kitchener's name shouted over and over. Coming to their senses, the voice, which was real, was coming from beyond a nearby window. They both ran to it, and Winston flung it open. Beneath them was a newspaper vendor, with a bundle of papers under one arm, and in his other a single copy of the latest edition. The man was shouting, quote, Kitchener drowned, no survivors, unquote. Soon after, the two men, hoping to clear themselves by proving much of the blame rightfully belonged to the war minister, found out that Kitchener, on his way to St. Petersburg via the HMS Hampshire, had drowned when the vessel hit a mine and there were no survivors. And so Kitchener was now one of the glorious dead, someone who had given his life for Britain. And with the war still going on, no one would countenance anyone, or in this case, any two, trying to clear their names by pinning the blundering war in the East on the tragic, heroic, stolid war minister, 
who was seen by many as Britain's only hope. Hey everyone, Ray here. What's the one thing we all have in common? You know, you and I. Basically, we all want to be better off financially at the end of each month. But one of the biggest obstacles to that goal is high interest debt. That's where Upstart comes in. Upstart can also help when that unexpected bill comes in, leaving you asking the sky, what do I do now? Simply put, consider Upstart. Upstart-powered personal loans can help you pay down high-interest debt, all online, with simple and easy-to-understand payment terms. And keep in mind that over 1.8 million customers have already been helped by Upstart. So whether it's paying off credit cards or getting cash for a personal expense, Upstart's one fixed monthly payment can put you on the road to financial freedom. And when you apply to Upstart, they look at more than just your credit score. They also factor in your income, employment, and other information to find you the better rate. You can check your rate in minutes for loans between $1,000 and $50,000, all without impacting your credit score. And you can even receive funds as quickly as one business day after accepting your loan. Don't wait and check your rate today at upstart.com slash World War II. That's upstart.com slash World War II to check your rate today. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash World War II. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So um, the following is a short uh, infomercial, if you will, about the World War II tour. Uh, everything's set up. It's booking. It's ready to go. All the prices and the dates are set. And so it's just some information that Terrace and I wanted to, to share with you. So I hope to see as many of you as I can. And um, I'll be out with episode 98 as soon as I can. Just to let you know, I have started a new podcast with Cameron Riley of the Napoleon podcast. We're doing the Life of Caesar. So you could go on iTunes or wherever and just look up Life of Caesar. We've done four episodes so far. So please check it out. Let me know what you think. Um, it's, it's kind of laid back. It's kind of casual. We have fun with it, but we're also covering all the events and all the amazing things that this man did. So please check it out. Let me know what you think. Take care, everyone. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So back with us today is Terrace Cassidy from Geek Nation Tours. Hey, Terrace, how's it going? Great. Yourself? Doing good. We just wanted, the two of us just wanted to let all the listeners know that we finally got all the, the package worked out, the pricing, the dates, the locations of everything, and we just wanted to take a couple minutes and share it with you. So since I will be in a lot of ways... One of the big-eyed uh, tourists just walking around looking at all this stuff in amazement. I'm going to let Terrace take over from here. But we're just going to give you a good idea of what's going on per day and all the different exciting things that we're going to look at. And I'm just really looking forward to this. So, Terrace, how would you like to start out? Sure. So uh, maybe we'll just do a quick day-to-day thing. Sure. If, if that's okay. Okay. Absolutely. And uh, so, as you know, we're doing – we're going to go from front to front to front. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, we're going to a uh, theater to theater, I guess maybe right. that might be more appropriate. And uh, so first we start with the Battle of Britain. So we're really excited about that. Uh, mm-hmm. It starts uh, the tour runs just so everybody knows that the tour runs from the eighth to the eighteenth, I believe. Oh, sorry, the ninth of September uh, uh-huh. through to the seventeenth uh, of September. Okay, ninth. Okay, okay. Yeah. So everybody, everybody knows that. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, as the first day, we're going to all congregate in London, of course. Gotcha. So everybody's going to go into London. Uh, I'll make sure everybody knows how to get to their hotel room mm-hmm. uh, You and uh, make sure that you're detailed and safe. I'll be there, obviously, the day before. So when people come in, I'll, 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 I'll also be in uh, contact with anybody who's having the, uh, to get there. Gotcha. So 
so from there, we're going to have kind of a free day because, of course, I'm welcoming everybody at the at the hotel and mm-hmm. taking care of everybody's luggage and all that other stuff. And you can go off and, and go like to the Tower of London Museum or the HMS Belfast if you want to do more World War stuff, uh, World War II stuff, right. or the Imperial War Museum, that kind of thing. So it's kind of be a free day. But then at night, we'll get together for our welcome dinner. And, mm-hmm. and that's when we're all get together and and and, uh, and start build, building the camaraderie that always happens on my tours so that'll be a lot of fun okay. and of course you'll be there and and we'll give a whole bunch of uh speeches and hellos and start our 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 contest on who knows more about world war ii <laughs> that's fine uh, and it, yeah between that and toast uh the night should that's, be pretty warm pretty fast that's that's right yeah and you know that i'm gonna i'm gonna pile of drinks on you so i could have any chance of winning that at all i'll be like what war? So, what okay that's right Sure. So on the second day, we'll go to uh, Dover, and what we're going to do there is uh, ca- uh, stay a couple days and see the, th- the sites around there that have to do with, uh, with the Battle of Britain. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll go firstly to the Dover Castle and see the secret tunnels of Dover Castle, which uh, uh, had to do with uh, Operation Dynamo and how they, they, they took care of uh, some interesting things that happened then. Right. And... Uh, and of course, we're going to hopefully walk the cliffs of Dover a little bit and see some World War II pillboxes. So that's uh, everything is going to have a local guide. So mm-hmm. we'll have a local guide to help us through. And then the next day, we'll go to the Kent uh, Battle of Britain Museum and the Battle of Britain Memorial. So we're right. going to really try to try to 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 focus on that, and of course, really talk about uh, Churchill's the few. Right. right. I've had a so, lot of um, – I'm sorry. I was just going to say I've had a lot of my listeners email in about those two places, and they said you definitely have to see those. So I, I'm really looking forward to those. Awesome. Very good. And then, of course, the next day we're, we're, we're going to uh, take off mm-hmm. from, from Dover, and we're going to go to the uh, Battle of Britain bunker. So that's going to be really interesting. Yeah, that, I think we'll see the kind of how operations were controlled and, mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. And then we're going to go to another memorial uh, uh, in the area, the Air Force's memorial, also. So that'll be really interesting, I think, uh, to see uh, perspective from those 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 grounds too. Nice. So. Oh, and I've been practicing my Churchill impersonation, so I will uh, throw it on everybody when we are at the uh, the at Ux, Uxbridge. So oh, that is just okay, icing good, on good. the cake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been perfect. practicing for months now. <laughs> Do you are pe- practicing the shower? That's none or, of your business. Don't worry about where, that. Where, the, <laughs> wherever I can, wherever I can, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, originally, I have to change the itinerary a little bit because uh-huh. on day five, uh, we we're, were planning on to go to the Bentley uh, uh, Priory. Right. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's been some switches. That I, I don't think they're quite ready for us. So okay. we'll switch things around a little bit. But uh, we're definitely going to go to the Royal Air Force Museum. Mm-hmm. And most likely on that day, we're going to go to the Benchley Park Museum also. Nice. That I've been so that'll be pretty to. cool. Yes. Yeah, so we saw see all their ciphers and code breaking and all mm-hmm. that other stuff. I think it'll be an interesting part to, uh, for that too. And then um, from there we'll go to Duxford, and, and I've been to Duxford Imperial War Museum. It's mm-hmm. a beautiful place, incredibly uh, well put together, and tons of stuff to see. But what's really great about that day, uh, Sunday the fourteenth, is that we'll also go to the uh, the Duxford War Museum has their uh, air show. Oh wow! Yeah, so we're going to actually see. Planes from World War II flying, and of course contemporary planes also. But, yeah. but it'll yeah, so it'll be kind of a it'll give you kind of a feel of of, of World War II of Battle of Britain happening right in front of us. Can so you, that'll be th- yeah, that'd be awesome. Can you pull any strings and maybe I can fly in the plane with them, or they could tie me to the top? Just something. If you could just do something for me, you, you better not ask that too quickly <laughs> because you know they actually do have rent. Uh, you can actually go flying on a oh, lot. That of would be amazing. Yeah, it is. Okay. so you better watch. I better be watch out. Okay, good point. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> so, and then uh, <laughs> the next day, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the the uh, birthplace of Winston Churchill. As you mm-hmm. know, that's one of the things Ooh. that you wanted me to include on the tour. So we're very happy about that. 
Excellent. And uh, we'll probably stay there for a good part of the day. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we'll return back to London and have kind of the afternoon off in London. So a little bit of free time, too, because I know that after travel, all those times, people just some people will just want to have a nap and other people just want to (laughs) explore things. I don't know which one I'll be on yet, but we'll see what happens. happens. So and then uh, on the the last actual tour day, uh, Mm -hmm. this uh, Tuesday, the 16th. We're going to go take a look at the London Underground, and we're going to see how uh, where people actually stayed uh, during the uh, Battle of Britain, where some oh, people yeah. hid, right in right. the in the undergrounds. So uh, we're trying to arrange a local guide for that. Also, mm-hmm. we'll stop by, probably just view it from the outside uh, St. Paul's Cathedral because right. it's a very uh, important place. About you know, it's symbolizing the. The, the steadfastness of, of London right. and uh, their Londoners during that time. So that's a really important place just to kind of at least see. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to go to the Cabinet War Rooms and, and uh, Churchill Museum. So that'll be a really good kind of end to the whole uh, Battle of Britain. And then, of course, on the 9th, that's uh, on the ninth day, the 17th of uh, September, we'll all, all get together and, and head home. So and again, you'll get detailed it explanations on how to do that so that's sad okay no that, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> and it's actually you know what it, it's funny because i i i really kind of do get a little emotional and teary usually yeah. at the end of the year and say having to say goodbye to everybody because right. i'm actually going to be staying there a little bit longer because mm-hmm. right after this i have to go to my uh my oh, other right. miniature wargaming uh uh um, tour Scotland uh, dist- Scottish Distilleries Battlefields and Miniature Wargaming. So that's my next uh, tour right after this. Oh, so wow. you guys will all leave me and I'll be that's there. Right. Oh wow, I am so jealous. Maybe I can uh, talk to the wife and my job, and I'll just go with you. How's that? Sure, okay. uh, by all means. And then you can come to Japan after that because I got after that one. I go to Japan. That might be a stretch, but I'll see what I can do. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. <laughs> so, oh. so, anyways. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, what's included? I guess probably everybody wants to know uh, that mm-hmm. the one thing that it does not include is air from worldwide because we don't know where everybody's coming from, and we right. have uh, we have participants uh, uh, from all around the world that will hopefully hop on board with us. Mm-hmm. And uh, what it does include is local guides, hotel stays, all the bus transfers, all the entry fees to everywhere. Uh, local, uh, yeah, I said local guides, mm-hmm. meals throughout uh, the whole bit. So, the, so everything's pretty much included. Uh, breakfasts are always included. The odd lunch is not, mm-hmm. but most dinners are also kind of taken care of. Also, so that's kind of a nice thing. And the total per day is in Canadian dollars, uh, three thousand five hundred for for. Uh, uh, the tour price and then the deposit is $750 per person upon booking that's the deposit mm-hmm. and the, the final is due I'd have to I'm, I'm still rec- uh, organizing the final right. but I su- suppose it'll probably be about 45 days prior to departure somewhere around there okay and and uh, with your permission, I was able to get for the members of the uh, podcast. It would be thirty four uh, three thousand four hundred as opposed to the three thousand five hundred. That's so right. Yeah, I appreciate so. that. And you all get a coffee mug. FDR Churchill, you let me know which one you want. Once you sign up, I will ship it out to you as soon as I can. Just another way of saying thank you, and and uh, we hope you enjoy this experience with us because I am so looking forward to this. Mm-hmm. They all have to bring their 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 mugs with them, though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. To uh, so so we can all sit with their coffee mugs. <laughs> There'll be fifteen people at the table with all the same mugs. People go. We'll go to a yeah, we'll go to a pub and say we want our beer in this. Doesn't fit a pint, but we want this. I don't know what the English version of what the hell, but anyway, so it should be uh, <laughs> right. it should be interesting to see. So again, just um, just um, email Terrace if you have any questions. Obviously. Um, we're very excited about this, and he's done this uh, plenty of times, so he can take care of you. But, again, just let us know if you have any questions, uh, anything like that. We are so looking forward to this. There's a couple things that are also important. Mm-hmm. Uh, we only have 35 spaces, okay. so please book ASAP. I've already got a whole bunch of people that have pre-registered, so I'll oh, yeah. probably contact them in the next week or so. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you haven't heard from me and, and, you're, and you have pre-registered, registered please send me a quick email at headgeek at geeknationtours.com mm-hmm. uh 
Uh, but we'll, we'll, you, we'll, you'll be the first guys on the line, and everybody else just just hop on as fast as you can because we want to make sure if you want a space, you get one. Right. Uh, non-geek spouses. Uh, this is something that I, we like to talk about. <laughs> so if you got a his, if you're the history buff, no matter if you're the 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 uh, woman of the household or the man of the household, mm-hmm. and and you have somebody else that uh, would like to travel with you but really doesn't want to geek out on history for the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> Send me an email, and we can work out a, a separate itinerary for them too. So, uh, you'll still have to travel with us, and uh, assuming that you're, yeah. or, or maybe they'll just want to go to London and hang out in London for Who for would? nine days by themselves. So exactly, yeah. you know, yeah. go shopping or soccer game or football game, I guess. Right. And uh, so, yeah, we do that whole non-geek spouse thing too, and it's a really important part of our uh, what we do. So please just give us a shout, and we will be happy to take care of you there. I did not know that. That is, uh, that's awesome because my yeah, would be the first one to want to depart from me. So yeah, that'd be great. It's really a good part of our, our what we do because mm-hmm. there's, I mean, not every geek, uh, a geek spouse is interested in painting miniatures, for instance, right. or, Star Trek, or really? Star Trek or something like that, right? So that's crazy. Yeah, so it's always geek. We always have some sort of argument, like we have the non-geek spousal argument of, but think of the history. That's dot right. dot dot. Uh, that's a hint on how do you how you can convince your uh, non geek spouse to come with you. That's right. And if we can get this one going, then there's other theaters we're going to do. We're going to go bounce all around Europe. It's just going to be amazing. So please, everybody, if you've thought about this or if you've been saving up your uh, your latte money, whatever, just uh, contact Terrace and let him know. And we are going to have an absolute blast in September. I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. Okay, so thank you again. And, uh, again, just uh, head to geeknationtours.com. Check it out. Let me know if you have any questions, um, whether it's um, you know material-related or whatever. But uh, if I don't know of any, anything, I'll pass it on to Terrace. And, again, I can't wait to see. I know there's going to be – I don't know what it's called in Canada, but we're going to have a lot of hop-ons. I've got a lot of people who've emailed me and said, oh, if you come, you know, let me know, and I'll meet you somewhere. So there could be thir- 30 of us on a tour. and. A tour. 200 people just kind of stopping by to say hi who knows but that all that all that all also happens a lot on my it? tours so yeah oh yeah before and they're all welcome if they want to come in and join uh join us uh at some pub in london or or in, in dover or wherever that we'd love to have them because that's always fun to have locals and and people that uh like minds the, the Geek Nation Tours is about getting like minds together. Uh, so it's actually a good part of if uh, I, I encourage that, actually. So okay. I'm very happy about that. I don't have that many coffee mugs, but I'll bring what I can. So we'll, we'll figure it out as we go. <laughs> All right. So, Terrace, thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. So everybody just let us know. And I hope to see as many of you. We both hope to see as many of you as we can in September. <laughs>